Hello, I'm Mr. Johnston, and this is Biology. Welcome to the Section 1.6 podcast. Uh, in this one, we're going to kind of talk about how organisms interact with each other, how organisms interact with their environment, and why it's so critical, as we can see here, the dependent idea, uh, why it's so critical that they do so so that they can live. So starting off, the idea of interdependence is just that organisms can't survive on their own. Uh, no organism, which is just a single individual living organism, living individual, uh, can survive without interacting with the environment and with one another. Now these interactions can vary. Uh, you could have a plant that could be an organism that's going to interact with physical factors like the nutrients in the soil. That's why we fertilize. They'll interact with water because obviously plants need water and they'll interact with sunlight so they can do photosynthesis to make their food. Uh, you can have where maybe an animal, so we can kind of do this as a plant, uh, you can have an animal that could be something like a rabbit that will interact with other organisms. So in that case it would be like the plant because they're going to need food. They'll also still need water, so they're still going to have stuff. They need a specific temperature. So there's still going to be other physical factors in the environment that they still have to interact with, that they still need in order to survive. And then you can have additional organisms, maybe we'll just do a fox here, uh, where once again they're going to need organisms. They need the rabbit, which remember the rabbit needed the plant, so this is all tied together here. Uh, and then as well, they are also going to have certain temperatures that they can survive. They're going to have where they might need burrows for their young, so they have to have specific conditions as far as the soil so they can dig their burrow. Uh, excavated out so they can raise their young. They're going to still need water. Uh, they're going to need all these basic physical factors to be in place or else they can't survive anyway. So we start to see this complex interaction where none of these organisms can live without the others. You know, the fox can't live without the plant or the rabbit because if either of them goes, it's done for. You know, if the plant goes, the rabbits go. And they all still need the right physical factors, which is why if the climate changes, it can be such a big deal for animals. You know, you can get such a drastic shift if there's something like a ice age or warming because it changes these physical factors and it can move outside of the range of physical factors that these organisms need to survive, which can mean that ultimately they have to either move if they're capable of it or it can mean extinction. That's why I've told you guys before, when you're looking at stuff with evolution, it's about what's best for the environment as it is then. And that's critical, that environment as it is then, because that's the physical factor part. You know, and those physical factors determine all the other stuff that'll be around, all the prey, all the food, that's gonna be determined by this. Now, the ways in which animals interact and plants interact, we're gonna group those into kind of two big categories. The first big category is symbiosis, which really is just gonna be a fancy word for organisms that live together. So this is going to be a more intimate way uh, of coexisting where you're going to see these organisms tend to live on one another or they spend a lot of time like really close to one another. Uh, so for example, if we look at mutualism, you're going to see this is a relationship where both parties benefit. But this would be like flowers and this would be like bees, which you can see that bees spend a lot of time on flowers. This is a close relationship. Uh, this could also be some birds that will ultimately live on and around, like, like you'll see them climbing around on, uh, different animals. So this could be anything from an alligator to a giraffe. Let's see if I can spell that right. Uh, and so what you'll see there is the birds that live on the alligator or the giraffe, I shouldn't say live on, but spend a lot of time on them, is that they'll kind of hop around on there and they'll pick off parasites uh, in the alligator's case, they clean up the teeth and such so that it doesn't get like rotting meat and bacteria that can damage it. And so they help out the alligator or the giraffe, but in the process, the birds get food. You know, they get the meat from between the alligator's teeth. They get the parasites that are living on the giraffe, so they go burrowing around in the fur, and they remove the parasite, which makes the giraffe happy, uh, because now the giraffe is not losing blood, it's, it's not losing energy to these parasites, but in return, the bird gets food. So both sides win. In the case of flowers, what you'll see is with flowers, they are going to provide uh, nectar or pollen to the bees, or it could be other things, butterflies, hummingbirds, uh, some beetles, some mice, some rats, uh, some uh, bats. 
not sure about rats. I might have uh, thrown that one in instead of bats accidentally. Uh, but regardless, they're going to go through and say, all right, I'll give you a meal, but in return, you're going to carry pollen to the next flower, which will allow me to reproduce. So it's a very efficient way of reproducing versus having to produce tons and tons of pollen and hope the wind takes care of it. They can produce small amounts of pollen, and then they can use some of the energy they save to make this nectar or to make a little bit of extra pollen so they can feed the person that's doing the job for them. And so it ends up being a win-win for both of them. The same thing is true with plants with like fruits, where they'll say, all right, here, eat this lovely fruit, but in, the, in return, you eat the seeds, and later on, you're going to defecate them out, go to the bathroom, and then the seeds now land in a pile of fertilizer away from the parent tree, so that way it's not just in the shadow of the parent tree where it really can't grow. So these relationships are very, very common, but you can see they're very tight-knit. You know, they're ones where you have a lot of direct interaction with the other individual uh, of the relationship. You have commensalism, which will be somewhat similar. The main difference here is the other side of this. So one guy benefits, the other guy just doesn't really care. It just doesn't really affect him. Uh, you can have a common example would be epiphytes. These are plants in tropical areas that grow on the branches of really tall trees. And so by doing that, it allows these epiphytes to get access to light. But they don't actually use water or nutrients from the plant they're growing on. They tend to grow in kind of a, a bowl shape in many cases. So that way water, try to draw a drop here, that was horrible, can ultimately land and get caught here, and so can leaves. So if you've got, uh, whatever, uh, leaves can ultimately go and they can land in that kind of bowl shape too. And then as they break down and decompose, it gives them nutrients. Uh, even dust can be used for nutrients. So because these guys are getting their own nutrients, they're getting their own water, because the light that they get is light that's already passed through the leaves of the tree that's holding the epiphyte up, the actual, I, I don't know if you want to say host, but the plant that's, that's the guy that, that's sheltering the epiphyte just doesn't really care. It, it's just not impacted at all. And so we call that commensalism. We have some bacteria that live like on our skin or in our digestive system that work like this where they really just don't have much of an impact on us. We're just a place where they happen to take up residence, but they don't aggravate us. They don't necessarily eat any product that we were going to use. I mean, maybe they'll eat like a secretion we have that we're getting rid of anyway, but it's not like that's taking away from us and costing us energy. So that would be an idea of commensalism. And then parasitism is when the one guy benefits, but then the other guy, the other partner here, is going to actually be hurt. And so this one is where you've got certain, like you can have some cases like mistletoe, it's kind of funny, is actually a parasitic plant. So it's kind of like an epiphyte where it grows on another plant, but it grows its roots into the other plant and it steals the actual water and minerals from the other plant. And so that way it's, it's actually taking away from that plant, that plant's being hurt. Uh, you also have parasites like tapeworm, we can go through a series here, uh, tapeworm, I'll do human ones. Uh, you'd have ticks. They suck the blood out of you. Mosquitoes you have as well that are very similar. Uh, we can do leech. I mean, there's lots of stuff that we have that will feed upon us. Bed bugs. So these are just some of ours. Dogs, and uh, I believe cats to some extent, can get heartworm. Uh, and you can see that grows through the heart and ultimately feeds on stuff in the blood. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of cases of these parasites. But the one main thing about them is they're living in or on their actual host is what we commonly call it, uh, the individual they're feeding on, and they're typically going to feed in something that's going to be part of a long-term relationship. They're not trying to just kill you. They're not just being like, oh, this mosquito is going to land on you, going to take your blood, and then that's it, you're dead. The whole point is that you can have lots of mosquitoes land on you, take your blood, and you're still alive, and the next day, more mosquitoes can come and do this. So their job is that they typically take a small enough amount out that you might not even notice it. But if there's enough of them, or if they're a big enough parasite, it will have some effect, but once again, it's an effect that might slow you down a bit, but ideally not kill you. Because for many of these guys, like a tapeworm, they're living in your intestinal tract, and if you die, they go with you. And so they have a vested interest in having you not die, at least not too quick. Some of them might kill you, but it would usually take a long time. It's more like marriage. All right, competition. This is going to be when two things are going after the exact same resource. Uh, so you can have scenarios where you might have a cheetah. 
I don't know if I'm spelling that right, but that's what I'll spell it like for right now. Uh, and you could have a lion. You can have leopards. That's an O. And you could have hyenas. These animals all live on the savanna in the same general areas, at least in certain spots, and they're all competing for many of the same resources. Now, luckily, they're not all competing for the exact same resources, so you can have where cheetahs tend to be more for gazelles, and they tend to go after more gazelles in open areas. You'll have leopards will also go after gazelles, but they'll tend to do so more in like wooded areas. They're more of an ambush predator versus cheetahs just chase you down. Uh, lions usually go after everything somebody else killed. Uh, so they'll eat just about anything that's meat, but they're not particularly good at killing themselves. Uh, but when they do, they typically go after bigger, bigger prey. So you'll likely see them go after more like a wildebeest perhaps or a zebra. And the hyenas are very good hunters of a variety of different size things, usually not absolutely huge, uh, but they're pretty solid hunters. I'm not quite sure what all they're going to go for, but a variety of things. We'll just kind of leave them blank for now. But all of these guys are willing to eat what most of the other guys will. And so you're going to get competition. It doesn't mean that they necessarily come up and clash directly. They can, where ultimately they'll attack one another to try and prevent competition. You know, you're trying to eliminate the other guy that's trying to eat your food or that's trying to use your land, or that's trying to use your burrow to raise young, whatever the case may be. But at the same time, you can also see that some of them will have different things that they eat that don't overlap. So it'd be kind of like you going to a party and there's uh, pizza with different toppings. And so you might be willing to eat pizza that has olives on it. And so even though you also like pepperoni pizza, because so many people are going for pepperoni pizza, you just say, fine. You know, they have already gotten there first. They were better adapted to get there to get that pizza before me. So what I'm going to do is just fall back to one of the other things that I eat. And so I'll go eat this food that they're not eating. In this case, it'd be like the pizza with the olives on it because there's no competition for it. That one's going to be one that I can just go eat without having to try to get there first or fight somebody for it. And so it's oftentimes easier. So when you get competition, what usually will happen is there will be either where one species is so good that they get all the food and the other guy just starves, or if they have kind of this difference in what they eat, one guy gets there and does a better job of getting the food of that particular type, so the other guy just has to fall back to his other choices for food. So they can both still kind of coexist, but they coexist in this uneasy way where like if you're doing the play, it's this way that you know if that other guy's not there, you can go for the main part. But if that other guy's there and he's ultimately a better competitor, you know, he's better at acting, then you can still act, but you just have to settle for the second part. You know, you have to settle for the one that's just below the main part, a supporting role. And so you can still survive, you can still act, but it's just that you can't do everything you wanted to or might, might want to. You've got to just say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and just do what I can do after this competition's already removed stuff from my possibilities. And then you'll see that competition can be a very, very intense thing is what I'll say if it's amongst the same species because you want all the same things. You're all after mates. You're all after the same food. You're all after the same places to eat, live, uh, you know, raise offspring. You know, it could be burrows and, and nests. And so you all want the same things. So it's very intense. But amongst different species, you can see where oftentimes it'll be more violent. Because when it's amongst the same species, oftentimes there's a lot of posturing, you know, where organisms kind of ram heads, or they shake their tail feathers to illustrate dominance, you know, or they bite at each other, but oftentimes they don't actually like kill the other person. It's more just a display where, look, I could beat you up, and then that's it. Whereas if it's different species, you'll see where oftentimes like the hyenas, leopards, lions, cheetahs, they'll kill each other's offspring if they find them unattended. They will oftentimes kill each other if they can find where a pack of hyenas locates a lone lion or lone leopard or lone cheetah and vice versa. So this one tends to be where they don't seem to have anything holding them back like you get in some cases with the uh, intra, they call that specific competition. That's just when it's the same. They just use the word in or the prefix intra. Whereas when it's different, they use the prefix inter, in case you see that. So with inter-specific ones, you tend to be willing to like kill for it. Whereas with intra, oftentimes, but not always, you won't see as much in the way of death. Uh, you'll see much more just posturing, chasing somebody off, things like that. And the last little bit, predation. This is where it's a much quicker interaction, where you normally are going to 
either eat and then kill in the process. That's like the mantis, right? They ate their prey alive, so the prey died, but it died kind of during the feeding. Uh, or you're going to kill your prey and then eat it. This would be like most big cats, uh, where they're going to ultimately kill the gazelle or kill the wildebeest and then eat it. So with predation, you're going to see this idea where you will fairly quickly kill what you're eating. And you'll see this idea where you don't normally interact with what you're eating except for that brief instance, and then you kill them in the process, so this interaction's kind of done. Whereas with parasitism, kind of do a wavy line here, uh, this is going to be where you have this long-term uh, relation with it. So in this long-term relationship, you want to keep them alive. You know, in this long-term relationship, you're more intimately intertwined with your host. This is not typically a brief interaction. You know, you might live your whole life tied up with that host, living in that host or on that host. If not, you might just go where you feed like every night on the same guy or at least a similar guy. And so you get this much more intimate, long-term relationship. Uh, and intimate doesn't necessarily mean good, it just means close. Uh, but this intimate, long-term relationship versus the predation idea where it's usually a much more violent and brief interaction that you have with your prey species. And so those two are very similar overall, where the guy who's getting fed upon uh, is going to have a bad day. Uh, but the degree of the bad day, and if it's their last bad day, can vary whether it's predation or parasitism. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. That wraps up 1.6. Uh, we'll be back with 1.7 in probably a couple days. I uh, hope you enjoy your break here uh, over Labor Day. Take it easy. <laughs>